I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. For today's episode, guys, I just want us to imagine that we're smelling freshly cut grass, we're outside, and we're about ready to go to the ball game, baby. There, there have been some days during this time that we've been inside self-quarantining and social distancing that I've been, I've been super bummed, man, because there's, there's just days where you're like, I can't, I can't go out. I can't go and do the things that I would do on a normal day. On top of that, and this is killer for a lot of people, man, there are no sports happening. There isn't a major sports league in action right now, guys. There's no football, there's no basketball, there's no hockey, there's no soccer, and last but not least, the there is no baseball. The Chicago Cubs home opener at Wrigley Field was supposed to happen a couple days ago, guys. And opening day was supposed to happen recently, but due to the coronavirus, there was no opening day for baseball. There are no games being played. Nothing. Fans can't pack the ballparks to watch your favorite teams play. But more importantly than that, baseball tends to serve as sort of a symbol as the beginning of spring for a lot of people. The sport sort of serves as a wake-up call from our winter hibernation, but no opening day kind of means the alarm never went off this year. So to get myself into a baseball mood, since there's no baseball happening right now, I started watching the documentary that was made by Ken Burns called Baseball. If you guys haven't watched it, it's actually streaming right now on Amazon Prime. But Burns' documentary about the origin of baseball and the story of baseball in the United States is super fascinating, even if you're not a big fan of the game. And it got me thinking, I kind of want to just do an episode that has to do with baseball, but not like the origin story of baseball. I want to focus my attention on something a bit more specific. The thing I want to focus on for this episode, guys, has to do with the Chicago baseball team and a scandal that when it came out and was found out by the public, pretty much rocked a lot of the nation to its core. And if you don't know what I'm talking about yet, I'm referring to what's been known as the Black Sox scandal of 1919. So, batter up. And let's play some ball, man. <laughs> oh, God, that was just so... That was... Ugh. I'm sorry. So what kind of scandal, you may ask? Was it a true crime murder scandal? Nope. Was it a sex scandal? Nope, wasn't that either. The scandal had to do with gambling. Specifically, eight members of the 1919 Chicago White Sox working with professional gamblers to lose games of that year's World Series to the Cincinnati Reds in return for a hefty payout. There's actually even a movie about the 1919 Black Sox scandal that was made, I think, like back in the 80s or something like that. It's, it's an older movie. It's called Eight Men Out. And if you want to check it out, go ahead and do so. But it's a it's a highly dramatized version of the, of the actual event. So let's discuss it then, shall we? The popular story, the one that that most people know regarding the scandal goes something like this. In 1919, White Sox first baseman Arnold Chick Gandal and professional gambler Joseph Sport Sullivan meet in secret to begin plotting how the White Sox will uh, will throw the games of the World Series to uh, to get a, a lump sum of money, a hefty payout. Gandal then goes to other members of the White Sox, including pitchers Eddie Seacott and Claude Williams, shortstop Charles Risberg, outfielder Oscar Felch, third baseman Buck Weaver, utility infielder Fred McMullen, and the famous power hitter of the team, shoeless Joe Jackson. Players all get together and they agree to pull this fix off. And one of their main motivations is that the owner of the team, Charles Comiskey, this guy right over here, uh, is a miser with his money. He's really stingy. He doesn't, he doesn't pay his players very well. According to the story, pitcher Eddie Seacott, who has already won 29 games during the season, has a clause in his contract that says if he wins 30 games during the season, he'll get a $10,000 bonus. But Comiskey decides to bench Seacott for the remainder of the season so that he can't get that 30th win. Meanwhile, while all this is happening on the player front, on the gambling front, the gambler, Sullivan, is rounding up some crooked and some shady dudes, including New York kingpin Arthur Rothstein, to start betting big on the Cincinnati Reds to win. Now, if you were living in 1919 and you were just an average sports fan that wanted to try to make a little bit of money on the game, you would have definitely put your money down on the Chicago White Sox. They were the better team. They had three to one odds in favor of them winning the World Series. So yeah, you would have put your money on them. But when these gamblers start making hefty, hefty bets on the Cincinnati Reds to win the series, the tide is shifting in the gambling world. More importantly, because the odds are now suddenly shifting to the Cincinnati Reds winning the series, a lot of fans are starting to wonder 
what what exactly is going what do these people know that we don't and some of them start to wonder whether or not an actual fix is in now today in baseball the world series is a best of seven matchup if you win four out of the seven games you win the world series you're crowned the champion but back in 1919 it was a best of nine series you had to win five out of nine games to win the entire thing so when the world series arrives on october 1st 1919 the first game the ace pitcher for the white Sox, eddie seacott is up on the mound and a lot of people are like he's pitching there's no way that the Sox lose the game. They lose terribly. Seacott delivers a disastrous performance. The White Sox lose the game 9-1, to and for the second game, the White Sox lose that game terribly as well. And by October 6, 1919, the Reds have a 4-1 to lead in the series over the White Sox. Meanwhile, the Gamblers, who said to the players, okay, every game that you lose, we are going to give you the money that we owe you. And by the way, that money that they were going to give to the eight players, it was going to be 20 grand after every single game, thus adding up to a total of $100,000 to be uh, distributed between eight players. The gamblers don't pay the full amounts to the players after every game, and the players start to get pissed off. It gets to the point that the players become so restless that they decide to go, you know what? Screw these guys. They're not even fulfilling their side of the bargain. We're going to go out here. We're actually going to play, and we're going to try to win this thing now. So the White Sox start to rally, and they win the next two games and bring the series to a 4-3 split. But in game eight, the Cincinnati Reds pull out the victory, they win the fifth game, and they win their team's first ever World Series championship. Now, here's the question. Why did all of a sudden the Sox lose after they're on a two-game winning streak? The team is hot. Why would they lose? Because apparently, one of the gamblers, Arthur Rothstein, sent a hitman by the name of Harry F. to uh, intimidate, shall we say, one of the players and, uh, and his family. If he didn't deliver the way he was supposed to, eh, something bad might happen to him or his family. So the World Series is over. The Cincinnati Reds win, the Chicago White Sox don't even get their full payment, and they've lost the World Series when they were expected to win the whole thing, but no one really investigates it, no one really dives deep into it until a year later in 1920. In 1920, evidence is discovered that a game between the Philadelphia Phillies and the Chicago Cubs was set to be fixed by professional gamblers. So an investigation into baseball games being fixed officially kicks off, and with this investigation, it slowly starts to turn its eye toward the 1919 World Series. And first, one of the gamblers, a man by the name of Bill Marg, publicly comes out and said, yeah, I was involved in it, I had something to do with it, it was, it was a total fix. I Absolutely. And then the ace pitcher of the White Sox, Eddie Seacott, publicly confesses in front of a grand jury. He says, quote, I don't know why I did it. I needed the money. And over the next few days, other players, including Jackson, Williams, and Felch, admit their involvement. In the end, the eight players of the Chicago White Sox are charged with nine counts of conspiracy, and on top of that, the media dubbed them the Black Sox, because, you know, it's a play on White Sox, and because they stained the game and its purity, their, their socks are now stained black, thus the Black Sox. It's, you know... It's journalism. However, the players would end up being found not guilty after coincidentally some paper records that included the players' testimony seem to mysteriously vanish. So the players are found not guilty in August of 1921. Great, their names have been cleared by the law, right? Except for the fact that the commissioner of baseball at the time, a man who's gloriously named Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, which I promise you will be the name of my firstborn, regardless of gender, Landis officially officially bans the players from baseball for life. He writes about the Black Sox scandal, quote, No player who throws a ball game, no player that undertakes or promises to throw a ball game, no player that sits in conference with a bunch of crooked players and gamblers where the ways and means of throwing a game are discussed and does not promptly tell his club about it will ever play professional baseball. End quote. Crazy story, right? Well, that's the story that's most popularly known about the Black Sox scandal, thanks to a man named Elliot Asinoff. He's an author who, in 1963, wrote a book about the Black Sox scandal called Eight Man Out. So if you ask somebody that knows about the Black Sox scandal, most likely they'll relay that story to you. But how about we take a little bit of time right now and separate truth from myth? First up, the miserly owner, Charles Comiskey, the man that wouldn't give Eddie Seacott his 30th win, thus denying him his $10,000 bonus, and he was 
was a miser with his money and he wouldn't pay his players properly. And so the reason that they got into this gambling scandal was because it was a matter of class warfare. The working man versus the upper, the upper 1%. It's a total fabrication. Because according to records, which you actually can look up online, I've linked them down below in the description box, the owner, Charles Comiskey, actually paid his players really well. Actually, above average in most cases for 1919. In fact, the player payroll in 1919 for the Chicago White Sox was around $88,000, which by the way, that was $11,000 higher than what the Cincinnati Reds players were paid by their owners. Remember, the Cincinnati Reds, they were the main team in the National League. They're, they played in the World Series against the White Sox. Oh, also that bonus that Seacott was allegedly promised for $10,000 if, uh, if he won 30 games in the season. It's an urban legend that never happened. It was, it was never promised to Eddie Seacott at all. Plus, his base salary in 1919 was $5,000. It was unheard of to give a player a bonus that was double their salary. I mean, there were bonuses as incentives for players to play better, but usually if they were gonna be offered a bonus, it was something like, you know, a couple hundred dollars, four or five hundred dollars at most, maybe. Moreover, when Arthur Gandal and Eddie Seacott were conspiring to, you know, come up with this fix and working with the professional gamblers to throw the World Series in exchange for all the money they were gonna get, uh, that happened weeks before Comiskey would have even made a decision on the uh, on the bonus for Seacott. Oh yeah, also, I should, I should also tell you, remember I told you at the top that it was Arthur Gandal and, and James Sullivan that meet in secret to uh, to come up with the World Series fix. Turns out it was the players on the White Sox, Arthur Gandal and Eddie Seacott, that went to the gamblers and said, hey, we got an idea. We want to throw the World Series and you guys can make a ton of money and in return for us throwing it, you can pay us a hefty sum. And and here's the thing about, uh, about fixing games. This wasn't a first time sin happening in, in baseball in 1919, the, the idea of throwing games for money. Back in 1877, four players of a Louisville, Kentucky team botched games so that their team wouldn't win the pennant in exchange for money. Plus, allegedly, this wasn't the first World Series that was trying to be fixed by players. Apparently, it was also happening in 1903, 1905, 1914, 1917, and 1918. Oh, and remember when I told you that the uh, that the White Sox started rallying and then some hitman comes out of nowhere and he threatens one of the players with physical bodily harm to him and his family? This one was invented by a writer. So an Asinoff story about the Black Sox scandal, he says that Arnold Rothstein hires a hitman by the name of Harry F. to go and threaten uh, the pitcher Claude Williams and his family with physical bodily harm. Turns out, though, that in Asinoff's story, Harry F. is a made-up character. There was no hitman named Harry F. Arnold Rothstein didn't hire a hitman to go threaten one of the pitchers. There was no evidence ever found that William's life was in any real danger. It was a made-up thing. You should also know that Arnold Rothstein was never really charged with the crime of being a part of this Black Sox scandal. But that didn't stop some members of the press to suggest that these players were being led astray by, um, let's say, foreign influence. Because here's the thing about Arnold Rothstein. Not only was he a New York kingpin, a New York mob boss, he was also Jewish. And one newspaper, specifically the Dearborn Independent, wrote in 1921 that Jewish gamblers were corrupting American baseball. So let's think about this now. 1921, what's happened? Well, World War I has pretty much ended, and now prohibition is in full effect in the United States. Which means around this time, there's a lot of negative sentiment for Europeans, specifically European immigrants. Because for starters, it's these European immigrants, the, the, the Germans, the, the Irish, the Slavs, the Jews, they're the ones that are bringing their drinking culture to the United States. The United States, which is a beacon, a bastion of moral purity, and we we are trying to stop a uh, drink because the drink leads to the devil's work, and these European immigrants are coming to our shores and, and infiltrating our, our, our morality with their corrupt ways and their drinking. These American nativists believe that European immigrants are tainting uh, the United States with their culture and their ways, and uh, America, on top of that, uh, joined World War One at the end of the fight and uh, and and came out the winner. We won, right? We are the beacon of truth and hope and justice in the world. Not these, not these foreign snakes. It was about America and everything it stood for being a beacon of purity, purity. That's the main reason that this particular baseball scandal sticks out in American history. And it's not because people tried to cheat in the game. The difference with this scandal is that the public knew about it. Baseball was the game, the game of the nation. There was no pro football yet. There was no pro basketball. There's no pro hockey. There's no, just baseball. On top of that, baseball was and is still seen as the national pastime. 
Everybody can play baseball. It's the people's game. That's what makes the game feel so pure. Doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, what color your skin is, what gender you are, you don't need a lot of equipment to play baseball. You need a ball, you need a bat, and you need friends. So for Americans to see their national pastime, the people's game, tarnished by cheating and gambling and players, players fixing games to just try to get money, that was something that was unforgivable. And that is the Black Sox scandal of 1919. Guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me with this episode. Hopefully, uh, if you were somebody that thought you knew about the Black Sox scandal and I gave you some information that you weren't privy to before, hopefully I, I broke your brain a little bit and uh, opened your mind to a little bit of baseball knowledge. Thank you guys so much for watching this week's episode. Really do appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks to all of you that have been watching the videos, subscribing to the channel. This is uh, our third episode in a row back from a long hiatus. It is, it is awesome doing these episodes for you again. If you want to know what episodes I'm thinking about doing or which episodes I'm working on prior to them coming out here on YouTube, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I talk to you guys on those platforms all the time. You can hit me up on those platforms anytime that you want to. I am all done. Play ball. If you can. If you can go outside, if you're allowed to go outside and play ball or do anything for that matter. I mean, if, just at least have some peanuts. That's a healthy snack. I'm gonna go. See you later.